Hello and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Anne Kruijt and I'm the host for today's talk. If you are participating in the live webinar, you can submit questions or comments in the chat module of the Zoom application at any time during the presentation, or you can ask a voice question by raising your hand once the presentation is complete. Today's speakers are Helen Eaton and Desi Poole. Helen is a linguistic consultant for the Uganda Tanzania SIL branch, and also she's the branch linguistics coordinator. She wrote her PhD thesis on the grammar of focus in Sondawe, and she works within the Mbaya cluster project. Her research interests include Sondawe, Bantu languages, discourse, transaspect mood, and orthography. Lizzie is a linguist working with SIL International in Tanzania uh, with the Mbukwe and Rangi languages. She works primarily on the documentation and description of these languages, especially to support orthography development. Her MA was on the Mbukwe phonology with a particular focus on consonant clusters and vowel hiatus resolution. Please join me in welcoming Helen and Lizzie as they give their talk, Community Orthography Development in the Rift Valley, examples from Mbukwe, Rangi and Sandawe. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. We'd like to use this opportunity today to talk to you about some community orthography development in the Rift Valley, which has been taking place over the last 30 or so years by the language communities of the area in cooperation with SIL. And I'd like to start by giving a, a brief explanation of SIL, the organization Lizzie and I are both members of, and a very brief history of our organization's involvement in the Rift Valley. Then I'm going to talk a little about what we mean by community orthography development. And then the main part of our presentation will be a series of examples from Mbugwe, Rangi and Sandawe, which illustrates some of the complexities of orthography development. My research has mainly been on Sandawe and Lizzie's on Mbugwe. We've also both worked to a more limited extent on Rangi. And in this presentation, I will take the Sandawi examples and Lizzie will take the Mbugwe and Rangi examples. And we're going to talk about orthography issues which relate to consonant grapheme choices, underlying versus surface vowel quality, multiple suffixes and assimilation, lexical tone and grammatical tone in both noun phrases and verbs. And Lizzie will finish with some concluding remarks. So by means of introduction, SIL is a global faith-based nonprofit that works with local communities around the world to develop language solutions that expand possibilities for a better life. And as of last year, we're involved in approximately 1,350 active language projects in 104 countries. And these projects impact more than 1.1 billion people within 1,600 local communities. SIL's work brings together more than 4,300 staff from 89 countries who work alongside thousands more local partners and community volunteers worldwide. And our services are available without regard to religious belief, political ideology, gender, race, or ethnic background. Our vision is to see people flourishing in community using the languages they value most. And why do we do this? Well, um, our mission as an organization is stated as the following. Inspired by God's love, we advocate, build capacity and work with local communities to apply language expertise that advances meaningful development, education and engagement with scripture. So are we missionaries or are we linguists? Well, Lizzie and I are both. All SIL staff, though, are missionaries in the sense that we're on board with the vision and the mission of our organization, and that's why we're members of the organization. But not all SIL staff are linguists, although maybe most of the ones you've met are. Many have advanced degrees in other disciplines, such as theology or education, and work in other areas of the organization. SIL has been working with language communities to create practical orthographies and promote language development in the Rift Valley since 1989, when we started working with the Datoga people. And as you can see, we began work with six other languages in the area over the next 20 years or so. Currently, we have active SIL-led projects in three languages, uh, Burungay, Rangi and Mbugwe. We've got ongoing involvement in two more, Alagua and Sandawe, and we no longer have any involvement in the work with Hadza or Datoga. 
And the extent to which orthographies have been developed for the seven languages varies, as does the extent to which we in SIL have published uh, linguistic analysis on the languages. Our main publications have been those on Rangi by Oliver Stegen and mine on Sandawe. So what do we mean by community orthography development? Well, firstly, in SIL in Tanzania, we work where we've been invited to do so by the language community. So we respond to the community's initiative and invitation. And secondly, our, our role is to advise and not to decide. The ultimate decision on any orthography issue is made by a representative group of speakers, often a language community, um, forms a committee which represents the group as a whole, and that's how the decision making happens. Sometimes these decisions go against what we've advised as linguists, but it's not our place to, to impose our will. So we would love to have a linguistically perfect orthography if such a thing exists, but a higher priority is an orthography which is owned and accepted by the community and therefore used, which is the main thing. Uh, and in all of this, we also try to remember that linguistics is only one part of developing an orthography for a language community. So we try to apply literacy principles, for example, relating to the ease of reading and writing. We have to bear in mind that the other languages a community may read and write um, might have a bearing on our decisions. So we need to consider transferability issues. We also need to keep in mind technological issues such as the ease of using certain symbols on mobile phones. And we need to consider dialectal differences if we're trying to develop an orthography which works for multiple dialects. So let's see some examples of um, some of these issues in practice now. We can start with uh, the topic of consonant grapheme choices in Sandawe. Sandawe is a language with 44 consonant phonemes, 15 of which are clicks. This is the Sandawe alphabet set out in roughly phonetically determined groups with the clicks in the final uh, third in the final two columns. The grapheme choices here were agreed upon by a committee of Sandawe speakers representing different parts of the Sandawe speaking region. These representatives met in Kwantoro with Sandawe in November 2002 and again in June 2004 to discuss the choices. And I'd like to pick out a few of the choices that maybe seem more unusual and try and explain why these choices were made. So let's start with the sound, the post alveolar affricate J. Why was it uh, the decision to write DZ for this sound? Why not use J, which is not actually used anywhere in the Sandawi alphabet, but it is in Swahili for the same sound. Well, the reason for rejecting the symbol J was that Sandawi speakers in the east of the language area pronounce this sound as the alveolar fricative Z. So a word such as Jigida in the west, meaning heart, is pronounced Zigida in the east. And the consensus was that it would be confusing to use J in the orthography for those in the east, but equally confusing to use Z for those in the west. So a compromise was needed, which could work for both. And the thinking behind choosing DZ was that D and Z were known from Swahili and pronounced together fast sounded something like J. It was also easy to read the two symbols with the pronunciation Z by simply dropping the D. And another factor which uh, influenced this choice was that intuitively it matched the choices for another two Africans. Um, written as TC and TCH, J and CH. And you may at this point be wondering, well, why weren't these sounds written with a C and a CH? Isn't that more logical? Well, this was because the orthography decision makers wanted to use C for the group of dental clicks that you can see highlighted now, where CH is used for the aspirated click. And again, you may now be thinking, well, why didn't we use J since that was a spare letter, it could have been used. But the reasoning from the Sandawe speakers involved was that J was just too common in Swahili and very familiar. It was also very common after N. And since Sandawe used N for a nasalized click, NJ would have looked particularly awkward and caused additional confusion. The disadvantage of using C for the dental click can be seen now if we compare 
the aspirated Africa with the aspirated dental click. The Sandawe graphene for the aspirated dental click is what Swahili uses for the Africa. But this was considered the lesser of two evils in comparison with the potential confusion of using something else like J and NJ for the clicks. One area where the advice from SIL to the community was to follow the orthography decisions of the languages in Southern Africa was the click inventory in general, and the community agreed with this, as you can see here, as well as using C for dental clicks, we have Q for post alveolar clicks and X for lateral clicks, as in, for example, Zulu and Kosa. The representation of click accompaniments is also largely following those languages in Southern Africa with aspiration represented by H and ejective release by an apostrophe. These symbols follow the click symbols, which fits intuitively with the pronunciation for the speakers. In contrast, N for nasalization and G for voicing precede the click symbol, again, just fitting with people's intuitions about how these sounds are pronounced and therefore how they should be written. One area where Sandawi doesn't follow languages like Mosa and Zulu is in the use of the symbol H, though. In Sandawi, it can represent aspiration, but only in the voiceless Africa and the clicks, not in the stops. The preference of the Sandawi decision makers was to have P, T and K, shown in green here, for the aspirated stops in line with Swahili usage. But this left the question of what to do with the voiceless unaspirated stops and how to contrast them with the aspirated ones since they're separate phonemes and need to be contrasted. And as you can see, the solution is an unusual one. The group making the decision felt the unaspirated stops should be represented by both the voiced and the voiceless symbols since they sounded something like halfway between the two. So this was preferred to choosing one of the symbols and then doubling it. Helpfully, the voiced symbol precedes the voiceless one in each case, just like it does in the alphabet. So BP, not PB, DT, not TD, and so on, um, which does make it slightly easier to learn, although it is unusual and maybe hard to learn at the beginning. And a final example of where Sandawe differs from Hosa and Zulu is in the lateral fricative, which is written LH in Sandawe rather than HL. And this felt like the intuitive order for the decision makers. It matches all the other examples where H is the second symbol in the graphene. So I think hopefully showing these examples together gives you an idea of how one decision affects another decision affects another decision. And with so many phonemes to deal with, you have to make sure the whole system fits together. And by doing that, you sometimes end up with something that differs quite a lot from other languages. Does it matter that Sandawe differs from Khalsa and Zulu and other languages? Well, not to the Sandawe, and that's the main point of community orthography development. The other languages are 3,000 miles away, and there's no transferability issue because the only people likely to be looking at the orthographies of these other languages, as well as Sandawe, are linguists. The Sandawe orthography was developed to make sense to people who may also read and write in Swahili and English. So this was more important. And as it works for the Sandawe, it works for the community, that's the main point. And if there are differences, then that's fine. We can live with them. Rangi, um, now looking at underlying versus surface vowel quality. Um, Rangi has gone through a process of moving from an orthography, which represents the underlying form, to one where it now represents the vowel quality more transparently. Let's look at the difference by way of some examples. Rangi has seven phonetic vowel qualities represented by the graphemes in the table. Contrastive length gives 14 phonemes, but here we're concerned only with quality. A leftward spreading ATR harmony process operates so that minus ATR vowels surface as plus ATR when the plus ATR high vowels E and U appear later in the word. The original orthography proposed writing the underlying forms of these vowels. So in the word for farmer, there is a class one prefix mu, the root rim, and the agentive suffix e, which is plus ATR. This suffix causes the preceding vowels to surface as plus ATR as well, giving the surface form murimi, whereas the orthographic form kept the underlying quality of the prefix and root vowels using barred vowel graphemes. 
It's also possible for a plus ATR root vowel to trigger harmony in any prefixes, as in the word to believe him, kumuruma. Here, both the infinitive and third singular object prefix surface with plus ATR u, but were written with the barred grapheme. Linguistically, there's nothing wrong with this. And actually as linguists, we might like this approach a lot because the morphemes will always look the same and that helps us see how the words are structured. We can decode the words quickly by analyzing the morphemes and putting them together to make the word. An orthography like this, which consistently represents the underlying phonemes is often called a morphophonemic or deep orthography. However, when Rangi people speak Rangi, they do not figure out meaning by consciously analyzing the morphemes and putting them together to make words. And they're not helped by an orthography that requires this level of linguistic knowledge. We want orthographies to be as intuitive as possible to the community, because that's a huge factor in whether the orthography will be accepted and used. The decision to write the underlying form was made more than 20 years ago and did not have the literacy inputs that we now know is so important. When people first learn to read an alphabetic language, a significant amount of time goes into learning sound symbol correspondences. A Rangi learner who is already literate in Swahili first has to learn that there are seven vowels instead of five, and so lessons focus on comparing minimal or near minimal pairs to illustrate the need for seven vowel graphemes. As part of this process, Rangi learners should be well drilled into knowing that the barred I is pronounced I and the barred U is pronounced U. It is then completely counterintuitive to present to them the written form containing barred vowels because murimi is not a valid Rangi word. The word for farmer is murimi, and the sound symbol correspondences that have been learned mean that the reader expects the word farmer to be written with unbarred vowels. Asking people to read a symbol with a different sound undoes the learning of the sound symbol correspondences that have already been taught. An orthography which consistently writes the surface phonemes, as in murimi with the unbarred vowels, would be called a phonemic or shallow orthography. Testing that I did in November 2020 suggested that people struggled to read the old system and follow up testing and discussion in June 2021 led to the decision to change the orthography to the more intuitive version. It's true that this approach may result in orthographic ambiguities. For example, consider the verbs to cultivate and to extinguish. These are minimal pairs for e and i. In the anterior aspect, writing the output of the ATR harmony results in two identical written forms with different meanings. Is this ambiguity a problem? No, not for Rangi speakers at least. These forms are true homophones. And if words which sound identical don't cause confusion in speech, then those words shouldn't be problematic when their written forms are identical either. Maybe it is a problem for us as linguists because we want to decode the meaning more easily and we can do that, um, sorry, we can do that more easily by seeing the underlying form. But we're not saying that linguists should adopt this orthography in their work. Linguists and others can use whatever orthographic conventions we want. This is all about developing a standard orthography for use by the community whose language it is. It probably sounds now as though I'm advocating for a shallow or phonemic orthography over a deep morphophonemic one, but that's not quite the whole picture. It's long been accepted that representing phonetic forms doesn't work well, but debate has been going on for a long time over whether a shallow or deep orthography works better. Both approaches are based on the idea that orthographies should represent sounds the way native speakers perceive them. The problem comes with disagreement about whether phonemes or morphophonemes are more psychologically real. Neither a phonemic nor a morphophonemic system matches native speaker perception all the time. Even if a phonological process results in a sound which has phonemic status, the native speaker may not be aware of the change. In the example we've seen for Rangi, they are aware of the change because it happens at the word level. The current literature suggests that what works best from a practical viewpoint is an orthography that consistently represents the output of the lexical level of lexical phonology or stratal optimality theory. This meets the need of fluent readers who are helped by constant word, word image and also beginning readers who can sound out the words. Having said all this, um, we recognize that phonological depth is only one factor to be considered and other factors may take precedence. But after figuring out the phonemes and graphemes, following this principle of 
write the word the way it sounds is generally a good place to start with orthography design. The idea of a constant word image is not actually as simple as it sounds because deciding what constitutes a word is not always straightforward, particularly in the highly agglutinating languages that we see in this area of the world. Clitics are one tricky area. And so Helen is going to give us an example from Sundarwe. Thank you. Yes, there's a similar tension between underlying and surface forms in Sandawe when you have multiple suffixes or clitics which assimilate in different ways. So it's somewhat comparable to the Rangi situation with the underlying and surface vowel forms. This table shows the basic situation where a single grammatical morpheme, in these examples it's a clitic in each case, attaches to a stem. And two pronunciations are possible either without assimilation, as in the first of the last two columns, or without, as in the second. So, for example, the noun gele beabab, when the third person masculine singular realis pronominal clitic attaches to it, can be pronounced gelea or gela. The same noun with a subject focus morpheme, which is a long a vowel, can be pronounced as gelea or gela. In all the cases here, the final vowel of the noun can either be retained or not. And when it's not, the clitic vowel is long. So it's the same pattern for all the examples. The decision was made to write according to the unassimilated form um, in order to keep a constant word image for the clitic's host shown in red. And this is an important literacy principle as has already been noted, but an important difference here compared to the Rangi phenomenon Lizzie just described is that for Sandawe, the unassimilated or underlying pronunciation is perfectly possible in speech. And a further difference is that the morpheme causing the possible pronunciation change is a clitic rather than an affix, and it's attaching to a full word rather than to a root or a stem. So it's not that here we're, we're forcing a constant root image, which goes against pronunciation, but we're actually choosing a constant word image, which matches one possible pronunciation. And doing so helps to avoid the written ambiguity, which can result if the assimilated forms were written as shown in yellow. These examples though are tonally different. So they're not ambiguous in speech. Writing the underlying form ensures there's no ambiguity in the writing in the orthography either, since the tone is not written in this case. The single R symbol shows that the word is an object and the double R shows that it's a subject. So it's obviously quite a fundamental difference uh, grammatically and it's extremely common. So without making this uh, distinction possible in writing, we would have created a lot of ambigu ambiguity in the orthography. When more than one suffix or clitic attaches to a word, things get more complicated and it's, there is often only one pronunciation of the resulting form, as in these examples. So the stem ge, meaning climb, plus the applicative suffix te, and the third person plural object morpheme ing, cannot be pronounced get -e ing, but only get ing, at least currently nowadays. The combination of te and ing is identical in pronunciation to that of the reflexive morpheme ti and the coordinating conjunction, which is floating high tone nasalization, shown in green. So it is tempting to advise writing something more like the underlying form here in order to make the differences between the morphemes transparent. However, each morpheme combination has only one possible pronunciation and it's the same pronunciation. So forcing the writing of one as something other than how it sounds is counterintuitive to speakers of the language and would be very hard to learn, very arbitrary. We really don't want an orthography which requires its users to recognize morphophonological processes in order to write it well. So following this system, can mean that we have orthographically ambiguous forms like the ones highlighted here, where combinations of different morphemes have resulted in the same surface form, which is then written. So the noun tuum, darkness, plus a third person feminine singular realis pronominal clitic, sa, relate, results in tuum sa, darkness, she, um, a sentence fragment which is the same surface form as it became dark, which comes from the noun plus a verbalizing morpheme C 
and the third person masculine singular realis pronominal clitic, ah. Similarly, ta, water, plus a possessive morpheme and second person plural agreement is ta si sin, which is the same pronunciation as the same noun plus a possessive morpheme and first person singular agreement and the coordinating conjunction. Ambiguity of this kind is often not problematic though, as the grammatical context will provide disambiguating clues. So for example, darkness she, there has to be a verb in the clause and there has to be a third person feminine singular subject accessible in the discourse at this point. Or for something like I have water and, that's not the end of sentence, there must be another clause following. So some ambiguity can be tolerated. The question in orthography development is how to work out how much ambiguity is going to be okay and how much will cause a problem for the readers and writers. Let's turn to think a bit about writing tone. Um, so when it comes to writing tone, the options traditionally posited have been exhaustive tone marking or zero marking. And exhaustive marking in the African context usually means marking one fewer tones than there are tonal contrasts. So if a language has two tones, high and low, then you mark one, often the high, and leave the other one unmarked. This was the initial approach for Rangi nouns and nominal modifiers. But there were two main difficulties. Firstly, a rule of high lowering phrase finally meant that either the same words looked different in different places, so the constant word image principle failed, or the word was written differently to how it was pronounced in certain contexts. Secondly, and arguably more importantly, it simply didn't work for community. They didn't like how it looked with diacritics all over the place and they struggled to read. So the decision was made to simplify the system by only marking nouns, not modifiers, and also only marking the first stem vowel. This made the writing look a lot less intimidating um, it does mean that high, high and high, low nouns ha could have the same marking and low, low and low, high as well. Um, so there could be ambiguous pairs, but I haven't actually found any examples where this is the case. The constant vowel combinations um, haven't led to any um, minimal pairs. For Mbugwe, we're trialing an even more slimmed down version where we mark lexical tone only if not doing so results in orthographic ambiguities between words which are tonally distinct. Where one of the words has a high tone and the other one doesn't, we write an acute accent on the word with the high. This is a spelling convention rather than a marker of tone. And so as you can see in the examples on the left, the placement of the accent is not related to the location of the high tone. It's always written on the final vowel, which is easy for writers to remember. The intention is for learners to associate the mark with the meaning of the word, not with pitch. This means that we can have the benefit of a constant word image without the problems created by the fact that the word sounds different in different environments. We also write the acute accent on derived forms of the words which are marked. Of course, sometimes this simply distinguishes additional minimal pairs, as in the first example here, where both start and count can take the applicative extension. However, even if derivation does not produce a minimal pair, we still write the accent. In the, setting, in the second example, be bereaved and burn are minimal pairs, and we write the accent on the derived noun widow, even though, to my knowledge, there's no class one or three noun derived from burn. We believe that this will strengthen the association between the appearance of the word and the meaning. Although we have yet to test this amongst the wider community to see how well it works in practice and whether they approve of it, the translators rarely make mistakes with the pairs, which suggests that people will be able to use this system successfully with practice. Currently, 28 pairs, not including derivations, are disambiguated with this rule. But one downside is that the list of words is not likely to ever be complete. We will inevitably find more as time goes on. The second downside is that this rule only works when one of the pairs is low throughout. An alternative could be to put the mark where the high actually is, but this isn't considered worth it at the moment as it would only add three additional pairs, um, but would actually require a significant increase in the teaching of pitch awareness. 
my main question with the whole of this approach is whether the teach extra teaching is worth it at all. Um, disambiguation is probably needed for the pair other versus many, but for other pairs, the context should give sufficient clues to the meaning. For example, the word say will very often be followed by direct speech. Similarly, every instance of be bereaved in the translation that we've done so far is immediately followed by the word husband or husbands. It's also very questionable whether pairs such as storehouse versus to spread out, where one is a noun and what the other is a verb, could ever really cause confusion. And so if marking is necessary for one or two or maybe three pairs, does that mean that we have to do it for all of the pairs and keep adding to the list as more are found? Or can we reduce the list to a small set of pairs with high potential for ambiguity and just leave the ones where the context will probably make the meaning clear? There are lots of questions to test and I don't have the answers yet. Different approaches are recommended for the orthographical representation of tone, depending on whether the tone system is stable or not. A stable tone system is one in which the tones are not changed by their tonal environment. A movable tone system is one in which various tonal processes operate, so that tones may change based on the tonal context. Certain correlations in these two types of system have important implications for orthography development. Languages with stable tone are often isolating, highly monosyllabic, and with limited segmental morph morphology, leading to enormous numbers of tonal minimal pairs in the lexicon. These languages benefit from more tone marking, and it's possible to use an exhaustive tone marking system without compromising the principle of a constant word image. Languages with movable tone are often agglutinative, with longer words, and because there are more segmental variables, tone does not generally have a high functional load in the lexicon. Many Bantu languages would fit in this category. In these languages, writing pitch or tone would mean that words were written differently in different contexts. The recommendation in these languages is to use a system of tone marking, which is linked to the function of tone in the grammar and not mark lexical tone at all, because the functional load is not generally high enough to warrant it. As we've seen, both Rangian and Bugwe do mark lexical tone. If we were starting from scratch now with Rangi, we may have made a different decision. But since we've already made other changes and the project is nearing completion, we decided to leave this as it is. For Mbugwe, you've seen that we're currently writing a very limited amount of lexical tone and testing in the community may result in us limiting it even further. I suspect we won't get rid of it entirely, however. We're now going to see some examples of how grammatical tone marking can look in practice, starting with Sandawe noun phrases. Thank you. Yes, there's one grammatical tonal phenomenon in Sandawe which can cause a lot of ambiguity if the orthography doesn't deal with it. Lexical tone is not written, so unlike Rangi and Bulgwe, um, with Sandawe there are 44 consonant phonemes, 15 uh, vowel phonemes, so minimal pairs are very rare and generally not causing problems for readers. But in terms of grammatical tone in NPs, when a pronoun and a noun or two nouns are found in a genitive construction, the tone of the head, the second word, is lowered to mark this relationship subject to certain exceptions. Such a construction can be compared with other constructions, such as copulas, in which the lexical items don't change from their basic or underlying tone patterns. And the decision was made to mark the tonal genitive in Sandawe by using a hyphen between the modifier and head as a marker of grammatical tone. So, for example, hewetla means he is a goat, no tone lowering of the second word, so this is a copula. And it can be compared with the second example, hewetla, his goat, where the second word is uh, the tone pattern is lowered. So although the hyphen can be described as a marker of grammatical tone, it is more properly a marker of the genitive relationship as it's still used when the tone of the head noun, the second word, is not lowered because it belongs to one of a set of exceptions. So for example, um, the heads in chi umu and chi gawa, my cow and my mountain, don't have their tonal patterns lowered because of their tonal melodies and a particular exception, but we do still use the hyphen. So we associate the hyphen with the structure rather than the tone pattern, but we recognize the structure largely through the tone pattern. 
If we don't use a hyphen in this way, ambiguity is very common, um, such as an example like this, where this, um, as it is written now, if we didn't introduce the hyphen, could either mean he will herd the goat or he will herd his goat, depending on the pronunciation of the word kla, meaning goat. Using the hyphen makes it clear which is meant and in that way, an ambiguity, which is not present in speech because of the tonal difference, is not found in lithography either. So here we have, um, he will herd the goat, hewe kla baloi, and hewe kla baloi, he will herd his goat. So a good general rule in orthography is that if something has a different meaning, and a different pronunciation, it should have a different orthographic form if possible. Although, as we're seeing, there are a lot of factors that could change that. Once the hyphen had been decided upon, additional examples with the same tonal lowering process on the second word came to light. And then, then the question became whether to also mark these NPs with the hyphen. Some locational expressions are clearly genitive constructions, as in ankarans, at the edge of the well, um, sort of well edge at in Sandawi. Um, so these are hyphenated. Examples where the noun is derived from a verb and describes the event of the verb and the modifier has a subject role in relation to this verb and understood as a possessor, these are also uh, hyphenated. So ti guesego, my thoughts, and nam one on. Nam's prayers are hyphenated. So G, the pronoun I, and then thoughts derived from the verb think. So I think my thoughts, uh, Nam prays, Nam's prayers. It's the same structure, it's the same tonal um, process going on. And crucially, all the constructions, even though they are slightly different in certain ways in their um, morphology, they're slightly different they're still thought to be of the same type. So for the Sandawi, using the hyphen is intuitive. However, there are constructions which exhibit the same tonal process of the lowering of the second word, but they're not felt to be the same as the previous examples in structural terms. And this is not an unexpected possibility because there is a similar tonal lowering process that happens to verbs in certain contexts. So in those cases, there's clearly a different grammatical structure in play. One of the structures where we've decided against using hyphen can be illustrated by this example. A locational adverb, gloi, occurs after a noun and can behave tonally like a genitive construction. So if the second word in this sentence, nam gloisa ie, occurs with its regular tone pattern, the meaning is nam subject lives behind. But if the tone of the adverb is lowered, according to the same rules as the head in a genitive, the meaning is she, someone else, lives behind none. So this is ambiguous in writing because it was felt that adding the hyphen to the example of behind none was not intuitive, didn't fit with the other category. A similar example, phrases which consist of an object or a postpositional phrase plus a verb describing an event, which are then normalized together, are also not hyphenated, although they behave tonally like a genitive as well. So here we have inadana kwa on earth into return normalized, returning into the earth, the return into the earth, or abramo hak a on calling Abram or the call of Abram. So these are not hyphenated. There was some discussion about whether these are really the same kind of NP or are these a verb plus um, another noun or a postpositional phrase, but either way, they were not felt by the speakers to be the same structure as the previous um, slide showed. Also, if a word modifies the following word, but is suffixed with the applicative morpheme te, or a postpositional clitic like dana, a hyphen is not used. These morphemes alone in the middle of the phrase can be taken as a signal that the word is linked to the following word. So something like labana iete teng, tree for living forever, or forever live for tree. 
and Re Di Dana Bo, which is uh, dream into meaning, meaning of into the dream, or more freely meaning of the dream. These are not written with a hyphen. So even though the tone pattern could argue for putting a hyphen in all of these examples, we have not done this because what is more important is that for the speakers of the language, as shown in these photos from some literacy classes, don't feel the examples fall into the same category as those on the previous slide. And when we got people to test out the developing orthography and provide feedback on issues such as the hyphen as a tone mark, their feelings were clear and we tried to follow them. So as in other orthography decisions, speaker intuitions and acceptability get the deciding vote in the end. So if we turn now to grammatical tone in Mbugwe, these examples illustrate tonal contrasts in the tense aspect mood system. The tonal marking is simplified to show um, only where the contrast is. So notice that in each pair, one form is in the present tense and the other is not. So we have he is saying versus he will be saying, and they do not sleep versus they did not sleep. This observation led to the decision to mark the grammatical category present tense. And since we are already using the acute accent for lexical tone, we wanted to choose something that would look very different to minimize the chance of any confusion. We chose to use the circumflex or kofia as we describe it in Swahili. It's written at the beginning of the verbal word, which serves to cue the reader to the correct meaning early. The need for this symbol is taught using contrastive pairs as in the first two examples. But again, in order to more closely associate the meaning present with the symbol, it's written on all present tense verb forms, even if there is no contrastive pair. There are several types of option available when choosing the symbols to use to mark tone. Lexical tone in African languages is very commonly marked with diacritics, such as the acute accent, which we've seen for Rangi and Mbugwe earlier. And we've also seen the hyphen and circumflex for grammatical tone. Asian languages often use leftover consonant letters, such as Q or X. And the use of numbers has been trialed in Mexico, but without much success. So it's probably better to keep numbers for tonal analysis rather than for a practical orthography. In the early days, options were limited to whatever was available on a typewriter, which is probably why most of the languages SIL works with in Tanzania use the barred I and U for extra vowels in the seven vowel languages, as these could be typed by first keying the unbarred letter and then going back over it with a hyphen symbol. Nowadays, we have a much wider choice of symbols available to us, but it's important not to get carried away. For community members, whether the symbols look nice and are reproducible on their phones are likely to be the biggest concerns, and the re responsibility is primarily on us to ensure that the different software will cope with the symbols that are chosen. For example, these are screenshots of an email from me to Helen. The first shows what I saw when I sent it, followed by what showed up on Helen's screen when she received it. As you can see, the emoji has been treated differently, and the one Helen received doesn't really look the way I was intending it to look. When we look at Helen's reply, it gets worse. Now, Helen's screen shows a normal smiley face, but on my screen, I got a capital J. I've learned to read capital J's as smiley faces when I get them from Helen, and although it's slightly odd, I have now got used to it. However, what's going on behind the scenes is indicative of a bigger problem. The different email software we're using is treating the symbols in different ways. When designing orthographies, we need to ensure that all software deals with all the symbols used in the way that the user both expects and intends. There's not time to go into the details, but getting this wrong can cause problems for running searches, sorting into alphabetical order, and for what happens when a word is too long to fit at the end of a line. This might not seem like a big issue, except for those of us who spend our time working on computers, and especially so in Tanzania, where the orthographies we're developing are not likely to be given any official status. But if we ignore the problem because it doesn't matter now, then we do a disservice to the community if it does become a pertinent issue in the future. So when we needed a new symbol for the Rangi orthography, we didn't give the community completely free reign in their choice. Rather, we gave them several options that we knew met the technological criteria, and then they chose from those options. This is the conclusion Helen wrote for me that the email exchange referred to, but I'll expand it a little. 
Orthography development is indeed complex. We've looked at some linguistic factors, such as phonological depth and recommendations in the approaches to marking tone, and also considered important literacy, the important literacy principle of maintaining a constant word image. We've also seen that we have a responsibility to ensure that the symbol choices made are appropriate for use with all kinds of software. As linguists, it can be tempting to consider the linguistic factors as the most important. However, the acceptability and therefore use of new orthographies depends on non-linguistic factors as much as, and maybe even more than, the linguistic ones. There may be government policy to navigate. Cameroon has a national al alphabet that it requires all new orthographies to conform to. And for a number of years in Ghana, marking tone was just not permitted. Or dialects. Do we choose to write according to one reference dialect? And if so, which one? Or do we include elements of all dialects? Does the community want their writing to look similar to another language because that one is seen as more prestigious? Or do they want to assert their identity by writing differently? And before you even start choosing graphemes and thinking about spelling, you might first need to consider which script to use. More often than not, some of these factors will conflict with others. And our job is to balance the different factors to come up with a workable outcome, whilst the community has the final say. All the way through the development process, we seek to evaluate how well it's working and make adjustments. It's an activity that takes a number of years of trial and improvement. And as languages change, there will probably be need for changes to the orthography too. Here are our references and some suggestions for further reading if you'd like to learn more about this topic. And thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Helen and Lizzie, for your presentation. I found it really interesting. With that, we can start the question and answer section. You can either um, raise your hand and I will send a request to unmute, or uh, you can write your question in the chat module and I will read it out. Please remember that the webinars are being recorded so that if you ask a question, this will be part of the recording and it will be released on the YouTube channel. Um, I think I'll start with my own question. Um, so I found it really interesting. <laughs> Uh, your presentation, I've been looking a little bit at the spelling of Iraku when it comes to social media. Um, so my main question is, um, I'm assuming both Sandao and Ranki are already oh, sorry, informally being written. Um, have you looked at what you find on the WhatsApp messages, the social media platforms and so on? And how does it reflect on the orthography that you are developing? Um, I can answer, but not based on the Rift Valley languages. So I've got more experience in Embea with how that's working. And what you do find is a bit of a mixture. So some of the unusual parts of the orthography um, that people are still getting used to don't really come out in social media posts. Um, but but there's, there are some people who would try um, to write long vowels um, if they have long vowels would try to write um, consonants that you don't have in Swahili, like BH or VH or something. Um, what seems to get most people, with the exception of people who actually work with SIL, is the barred vowels, unfortunately. That's, um, it is very easy to do if you know how, and we have sort of spread the word about that. Um, one option that I've um, spoken to people here about is um, having almost a second orthography um, for, phones and so on if it's something similar to the way in german if you're not writing a normal out you could write a different letter after the vowel to show it and what we can do is go for instead of a barred vowel we can go for a vowel with a high tone accent um, and that's a different option so there are ways to get around it but i think um because the the orthographies were developed before mobile phones took off I think Lizzie said that there are decisions that maybe would have gone differently because it is quite hard to expect someone writing just a, um, on Facebook, for example, or WhatsApp to to go deep into the um, the keying to get um, to get to the the really the right symbol. Um, but it's something we're keeping an eye on. I don't know if you have anything to add, Lizzie. Yeah, I mean. Um... I think our translators have got keyboards that they have um, downloaded for their phones. And so they use the special symbols. Um, so Mbugwe has an epsilon for the um, E and what look, and it, well, it uses the IPA symbols for E and R. 
Um, I wouldn't be surprised if people swapped the F for a number three, um, like we see in, um, yeah, um, yeah, lots of kind of replacement like that, I wouldn't be surprised. And maybe the backwards looking C would be replaced by a forward, a normal looking C. That's maybe less likely because of C being in a letter in Swahili. But I wouldn't be surprised if people found their own kind of ways around it um, if, if downloading a keyboard isn't, isn't something that they can do. Um, but yeah, we, the keyboards are available and they're free. So we hope that um, people, some people at least, will want to start making use of them. Um, but yeah, it's probably not going to be hugely widespread. That is a challenge. Um, yeah. Thanks, really interesting. Yeah. Um, I'll go to Marta, who's first with his hand. Yeah, the wife, the death. Um, but, uh, and I have some questions also right to the orthography, but uh, but I, there's a lot of questions I really want to ask it's about this intuition that was mentioned several times and specifically for the LH. Uh, Helen, you mentioned two things, uh, in, intuit, intuitive order and, and the system uh, that H is, is uh, second in, in more die graphs. Um, so, but it, do you have any insight in what kind of intuition people have uh, about this uh, lack of fixatives and, and that it should be written LH. Can you say a bit more? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, it's hard to remember now the options that we gave. I was there at the time, but it was nearly 20 years ago now, so I'm struggling. Um, but I know that one of the things, some of the things we tried, we realized quite quickly that people were making mistakes and reversing the order of things which made you think, okay, it seems to be more natural to put it the other way around. And I think with the, the order of the LH, um, because people knew sh from Swahili and to a lesser extent kh, kh, and th from Swahili and even dh in Swahili, it, it was, the idea was that the h is bringing the fricative quality and what goes before it is showing sort of how it sounds a little bit like another sound so that's an l so that seemed to be what people were going for i th i'm not sure if we gave um yeah i really can't remember if we did suggest other ideas at the time um i think one of the hard things with the intuitions is who are you asking about these intuitions and how much how much do they read and write any other language how much are they really thinking about what you're asking and that's what we constantly struggle with because um, we're right, we're often asking these questions right at the beginning of the orthography development process. So people aren't used to seeing their language written down in any way. And they're most likely to say it looks weird because they've never seen it written down. So trying to get to the bottom of it and not to be making too many changes over a period of time is, is tricky. But I think it was mainly for the clicks in Sandawe with the order of whether the, the C, the Q, or the X came first or second, that was that was what people felt quite intuitively. And, and it does fit with the pronunciation of, of where, how salient the, the, the nasalization or where the adjective is coming, it, it does fit together quite nicely. So people, people did sort of feel that was systematic. Yeah, I, I wonder whether, I mean, uh, in addition to the order of, of the articular movement, but there's also something, if you see as a kind of L, how would you, which order would you use? And that may be different in, in different kind of, uh, uh, yeah, uh, linguistic environment. So uh, so, so maybe for, for, for one language, uh, uh, representing a kind of L is LH, and for another one would be HL. I was just, it crossed my mind. Yeah, I think it could be. I mean, this is also one of the hard things that we found, which I was trying to illustrate with the Sandari examples, is you can't make one decision in isolation because every decision affects something else. And Sandari is quite extreme because of the number of, of phonemes, but it's true of it's true of tone marking as well, very much so. If you use this mark for this, you can't use it for that or, um, yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah. 
I have um, a number of other small necessary questions, but uh, Anna, you can come back and we uh, and then it's going to fall silent. Great, then I'll go to Andrew. I have a few questions uh, as well. Uh, first of all, though, I want to say thank you for really sort of taking us to school on this. It's been, you know, I mean, a really sort of deep dive with some uh, really interesting examples just to show how sort of complex this is. Um, one of the things that struck me right at the very beginning was that some of these issues associated with uh, the writing are, are sort of linked with these phenomena that I would think require quite a deep knowledge of the language. So my practical question is, when can orthography development begin? When does, when does it start? Like, when is, when is the point where you guys say, okay, like we know enough to actually take our first steps here? Does that start like after the, the, the sketch grammar has been written? Can it start before? Like, you know, how, how, how much do you need to know about, about the words of the language? You know, do you need a lot of lexicography beforehand? Like, where, when does it start? Well, I think there's two answers and it depends if you're asking people in SIL 20 years ago or now. Um, so the, the answer 20 years ago would be that you would sit there working on your um, lexicon, you would be doing a couple of years maybe of trying to understand the language before inviting some people to start looking at, you know, how do we write this down? But more recently, as an organization, we've gone for a, a more participatory approach from the start, and we've generally been moving more into the community side of development and I think it's it's better in lots of ways but it's incredibly messy as well because it means you get people giving opinions right from the start on how to write things before really understanding some of the issues so this is why we do a lot of going back and forth at the beginning um, so I've experienced that again more in Embea because this is where I've been more recently but uh, we've tr we have right from the very beginning the very first linguistic workshop we did in there was collecting words and people were writing them down just without any um, prior um, instruction. So write using the orthography that comes to mind when you write. Yeah. And then we've worked with that and said, okay, you've written all these words with a B. Is the B the same in all of them? Let's, lead, let's listen to them all again and see, do we divide them into one pile, two piles, three piles? So we're doing that more, which means now, which means we, we get people involved um, much earlier. And there's a, a, a trial experimental orthography very early on, but it has its downsides um, because you can start setting in stone or at least sort of semi stone um, decisions that you then regret because you investigate further and find phonemes you didn't know you had. Um, so yeah, there, there's some downsides to it too. Lizzie, have you got something to add? Um, I think that's the idea of kind of setting things in stone or seeming to early is, that can be quite a problem. I think for the, the example I showed for Mbugwe tone with the circumflex for present tense, um, I think, it's not as simple as those, those examples do work like that, but there are some other examples where I'm less sure now that um, the, the, the kind of, the analysis that I'm working off is completely there. Um, I think it's missing a couple of things. And if it is, then that potentially has quite big implications for what we're marking. So. Currently, there, as well as using, using that symbol for things that are kind of obviously present tense, um, they want to use it for things that are, um, or they are, using, they are using it for the present habitual, but again, that's a present habitual versus a past habitual, not totally distinct, but um, at least there is that past present distinction. But they're also using it for a form that something like you should be doing. So it's a kind of imperfective subjunctive, which I'm fine with them. I think that's okay. Um, but every so often they're, they want to add another one. So they say, oh, well, this, if it's happening now or a part of the activity is happening now, then we want to write it. And so 
then we start to lose the meaning a little bit associated with the symbol. Um, and I've kind of brought this up as it might be a problem, but for people who've already got used to it, and it, that for Brumble Gray, that's primarily just the translators, so it's not a huge issue. Um, but their their answer is, well, this is how this is how we do it now, and this is how we want to keep doing it. Um, so I, I anticipate some issues in the future um, as we get a fuller understanding of what's going on in that whole system. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. If I can jump in with a question there. Um, so how many people actually know their geography? So obviously people working with you on the SIL, but how would you spread the word to a larger community and engage people in a larger scale to actually use it? Yeah. Um, so as the languages we've been talking about today, probably Rangi has had the most exposure. Um, and there are, so in, in June, 2021, we had this workshop and we invited 30 literacy teachers, Rangi literacy teachers who have been working um, over the last 10 years, probably, um, teaching. Now, we don't know exactly how that's gone and how many, we have some data for kind of how many people they've taught, but those 30 people, um, they do represent a lot of different villages. Um, so the anecdotal reports are that thousands of Rangi can use the orthography. Um, I suspect that's a little bit, um, of a, <laughs> a little bit optimistic. Um, maybe it's, it's quite possible that several hundred have been taught, whether that means they have fully got to grips with it is, is much less likely. Um, from Bugwe, we're in the very early stages. We've taught, um, we've had a one two day workshop um, where we invited, I think there were between 20 and 30 people. Um, but again, the Mbugwe orthography is at the trial stage. So we don't also want to teach too many people that we then need to reteach if it changes. Um, Sandawe, I can't, I don't know. Helen, what do you think? Yeah, oh, Sandawe, Sandawe. it's hard. Yeah. So, I mean, there were, there was a sort of push in sort of 2005, uh, six, seven, eight, somewhere around then. Um, we were doing literacy classes in different villages. Um, and we generally found one or two people in each place who were very keen. And um, but I think the problem with ge was general literacy, desire to write in any language, ability to write and read in any language was relatively low for the country. So, and then you have the double whammy of that plus the language Sandawe being harder to write, so than average. So that was that has really. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of the words kwama in English. Um, the the literacy development has um, has stalled more in Sandawe because of that. Yeah, yeah. I just um, saw the comments from Bonnie, and um, it just made me smile because yes, I do try. I do when I write to refer to the clicks as glottalized. I just checked. I think I do, don't I? Yes, but I probably said ejective because of the orthography. And that's the thing, the orthography starts to affect how you think about the sounds because I see the same symbol and therefore I'm thinking of them as ejective clicks when I've actually um, been writing about them as glottalized ones. So yeah, it's, it certainly has an impact um, when you get used to the orthography of, um, on your understanding of the language, maybe not always in a positive way. Um, and then the question about um, using a lowered hyphen in Sandawi for non-genitive constructions with tone lowering. That's a really interesting idea. And we've not considered doing that. Um, we haven't, one of the issues is that, um, and now I'm testing my memory, but there are a lot of places where um, you get the tone lowering um, of verbs. And in, in your standard realis clause, if your verb doesn't have a realis pronominal clitic, the tone is lowered, Ed is nodding, this is good. Um, I think I'm right then. So that happens a lot and um, and people don't seem to have a problem with reading it. Um, I have to think about it if I try and read it correctly, but people don't seem to have a problem with that one. The one that sort of bothered me of, of that, um, the non-genitive or is it non-genitive, is the sort of behind nam, because in Swahili it's numa ya, and the ya is, is what the tonal genitive is 
the equivalent of. So to me, that was very much felt like it should be um, written with a hyphen, but that was not the way the people felt about it. So I, I still feel a bit wobbly on that one. Um, but writing, having a different symbol is potentially a way to get around that. Um, but it, then it adds the complexity for the speakers so and readers and writers. Helen, how do they write so you do words in some hours? Like you write with Chupa, what do you do? Oh, we, we follow T-C-H-U-B-P-A, I think, if I remember correctly. It's even a, an aspirated, but yeah, it does look funny. Yeah. <laughs> Andrew? Um, Lizzie, you'd mentioned, you talked about testing orthographies. What does, what does that look like? I think I might have, have witnessed a little bit of that when I visited you guys mm -hmm. in Howie. And I think that other people present would be really interested in hearing. I was really impressed with how, um, with how methodical it was and sort of how experimental it was and sort of how rigorous. Uh, so yeah, do you mind, do you mind talking a little bit about, about what a, testing an orthography looks like? Yeah, not at all. Um, firstly, thank you for thinking it was methodical and um, it, there was a method to it, but it, um, yeah, it was, um, it's probably not going to be possible to use any of the data I got for an actual statistical analysis, which um, I guess orthography testing would kind of be on a, on a scale. Are you doing the kind of experiments that you can quantify and perform statistical analysis and that is really going to convince other people who are maybe skeptical of what you're doing that what you're doing is the right thing and it can go from that extreme all the way down to like um helen described at the beginning just kind of having people write down words and see what they come up with is also a form of testing what is intuitive to to them um, we did some kind of reference testing over um, giving different giving different options and seeing which ones people come up with, I think there are a lot of different ways of doing it, and it depends what your um, what your aim is. Ideally, yes, we'd be able to do the full statistical option. Um, I think the testing the the lexical orthography hypothesis is a is a big um, big topic at the moment. Can we can we get more? proper data for that to say is that um, is are our, are our intuitions about um, writing the lexical the lexical level of the phonology are those um, are those right can we get the data to say that there have been some experiments um, most of what we do doesn't have enough money to do those kinds of experiments um, it's also a challenge in Tanzania where we're not able to do anything in schools um, you can do much more rigorous testing in, for example, in Indonesia, they've, they've, they can do it really successfully. And these orthographies have been then adopted into school systems. Um, we just don't have that option in Tanzania. So we are working with primarily um, adults who are already literate to some extent in Swahili. Um, yeah, so there's, a, there's a massive scale. We tend to um, have people, for, so for Rangi, I was having people read two versions of a passage. What I was trying to test was whether um, people could get the tone right on relative clauses. Um, so I had one passage which had a lot of relative clauses in it and another one which didn't have any. Um, and I was trying to see if there was a difference between people's fluency and accuracy when they read one passage compared to the other. The problem <laughs> with that experiment was that the people there just didn't have the literacy level to be able to test that kind of issue with. Um, that was the testing where we said, okay, it looks like people are really struggling to read full stop. Um, so maybe we should reconsider how we're writing the vowels. <laughs> Went right back to the beginning. Um, so some of the questions that we are trying to answer, you really need a, a, a good, readers with who are really quite good already before you can test them. Um, things like, Graphene choice um, is much more of a which one do you like the look of, and then um, do you do you pick the same one from the when you've give, got a list of words written in with different graphemes? Do they pick the same one each time as the one that looks right? Um, and simple kind of fill in the gap. Um, 
questions. Um, yeah, it's it's a huge topic. We could probably do several um, presentations to to cover the various kinds of things that that we're looking at. Yeah, I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> It's a dangerous thing to say that. Yeah, yeah I would <laughs> just add that um, from what, what I've been finding interesting is, is the longer I'm staying here and able to see sort of a time depth of, of stuff is that it's interesting how people's intuitions seem to change over time, which is interesting. So if you're making decisions based on intuitions right at the beginning with people who are not very used to reading and writing, even in Swahili, then possibly you'll find those intuitions are different later. And some of our, um, in Mbeya, we've had people working for sort of 15 years now, writing their language almost every day. And some of the things they wouldn't accept at the beginning, they do accept now. <laughs> so some of the things that were really problematic were writing slightly more underlying forms of clitics. Um, but now, eventually, there were some, some people who said, no, I think this would be better, this would make more sense, and they started to feel more comfortable with it. Um, so if you did the same test uh, at year one and year 10, you might get some different results as well. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we are, well, we're struggling with that generally, but one of the things we have to think of in our context here is that the chances are there will always be more readers than writers. So if a decision is making it slightly hard for the writer, which some of us are quite tough for the writers to, to control well, but has a really good benefit for the readers, there's, there's going to be more readers than writers. So um, we should err in that direction because sometimes the orthography decisions are um, in a, there's a conflict between what the reader wants because the reader wants things in a certain way, the writer, it would be easier if the writer didn't have to make all these distinctions, but the reader wants them. So yeah, it's, uh, testing is a huge topic, as we've said. Bonnie? That's a really good point, Helen, about the, uh, you know, just intuition is changing when you're a learner, one who's been using it for a while. And I'm seeing with that with our new orthography where there were some resistance to some of the more linguistically oriented spelling choices. And, and as the, the language committee has been working with us longer, they're more willing to accept these. At first they wanted things to look more like Afrikaans. And um, it's just taken a while to explain why they don't sound like Afrikaans, and why that's a problem. Yeah, that's, uh, we've, we've definitely experienced that. We've also experienced that sometimes we've had older speakers who are hanging on to something. And um, as if you wait long enough, the older speakers aren't there. So things then change because the majority, the, there are new Waze who are accepting of something else. So, um, <clears throat> and I'm, I'm not sure if we mentioned language change, but um, that's another big factor in orthography development because mm. often you can see that something is changing. So are you going to um, put in stone the older version, the newer version? How, how quickly is it changing? Are you sure it's changing? <laughs> Which direction is it changing? Or have you just missed something? And there is actually a reason why some sounds are different and some aren't. And um, We've seen that in some of the languages, not in the Rift Valley, but here in Mbeya, where um, people have insisted on, on a certain um, consonant combination, which is being simplified um, in speech, but they, they still feel like, it's a bit like which, which, which to me, both witches are pronounced exactly the same, but there are still people, depending on dialect, who, who pronounce them differently. And it's, it's that kind of problem. So um, we encounter that as well, um, as well as the dialect issue, the age variation issue. Raise my hand. One, one final uh, question for me, guys. I'm, I'm interested in when is an orthography ready? So like to, to qualify this, like when would you start printing say books of stories for wider distribution? When would you say, okay, like we have the orthography down, like we're ready to print off our, you know, our, our, our booklets, you know, 3000 booklets and send them off or whatever. Like when, when would you guys say, okay, this is, this is like ready to go. 
Well, we have a system, we have a policy and um, applying it is, is part of my job and it's very hard to know. Um, we, we give our orthographies different statuses. So we say um, experimental at the very beginning, uh, trial when we sort of think we have a first attempt at something. Um, then after quite a long time, years, uh, years of trial status where we're trying different things back and forth, we might consider it approved. And then if after a few more years, nothing has changed again, we would categorize it as established. So we go through experimental, trial, approved, established. And um, those are just internal terms that we use. And to try and judge when something has moved from one to the other is very difficult. But those um, different labels affect our, we have a policy on how much we print, basically. So we print very few copies when we're at a trial or experimental level, more at trial, more again at approved, and so on. But we still change things very last minute, which we have done with Rangi. And um, there are there are upsides and downsides to printing more early on. Um, you get there's more potential for feedback. There's more potential for setting something in stone when you don't want to. Um, there's there are we have different sort of ideas about something if we print something. Um, a sort of hardback book or um, something with color pictures that we, we think will stay around a while. Um, we want to make sure we're fairly sure about the orthography, but if we're um, producing booklets, paper booklets, nothing fancy, just a card cover or a calendar that will probably disintegrate um, relatively quickly, we can be more free about at what stage we do that. But I mean, there are places in the world where um, that would be a decision out of SIL's hands. That would be more of a, a government issue. There would be people, other people involved. But for us here, it, it, it's, it is our, it's just our view. And since we're not doing any kind of textbooks or curriculum material, um, it's really up to us how much we want to spend on something that then may get changed. Um, and it also depends on the size of the group as well. So with the big groups, we produce more things. Um, with the small groups, um, we know we won't sell or give away that many, so we keep the numbers lower. So there's a lot of factors to consider. Great, thank you. Yeah, okay. Um, on, on this, I think, uh, but I have another question. That, uh, of course, I mean, orthography spelling, it, it co goes on all the time. I was, very interested in that you go quite far in there. How do you write glyphics and all of that and, and, and present tense? And, but, but that will never end. There are all new things that can, and in the end, uh, the, the people who write win. No? If you write more, you, 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 you win. It's in, and it's inherently democratic. But I, I was, I, was um, I, I wonder about the Alakwa. You didn't mention the Alakwa. <laughs> So um, I, I talked to, to your, um, your Alakwa team and um, I, uh, I noticed there what they were using for writing and there were some, some weird things in it. Uh, but then uh, the people completely agreed that yes, that's weird. And the other uh, reaction was, but we concentrate on the spoken word. Mm -hmm. So um, the written word is, uh, is has not our priority. So I, I was uh, wondering whether that's that's uh, more common uh, the case in, in Tanzania that side, but also the other side for Alakwa because we went into the the, the, the local uh, small primary school there in the area and Roland and I we were giving them Alakwa text. To, to read and that was a wonderful experience. Um, but but of course then all the all the students there they're they're Muslim and, and you were bringing up uh, what kind of uh, of kind of uh, system to use at all. Is there any any new orthography developed in, in, in Tanzania where they where they've chosen for, for the Arabic uh, alphabet? Um, not that we are involved in an SIL. There are other um, Bible translation organizations, other people doing similar work, um, the Bible Society, um, Pioneer Bible Translators, some other people. Um, 
I wonder when it was that you were speaking to people about Alagua because it may not have been, um, if it was more recently, it wouldn't have been people with SIL because we had some people working. I think um, Anna Badman must have, you must have had contact with her at some I point. Have, yeah, but that was a long time ago. That was a long time ago. That was when we were working on, working with the language. It, it's been, I don't know if you know, Lizzie, but it's been quite a long time since we've worked with Alagua, although we know people who are, working um, Maybe on the word SAL. Um, if it yeah, was recently, they weren't. Yeah, there's another organization who are doing um, who are doing more with Allegra at the moment. And I think the feedback we've had from them in recent years is that um, the Allegra themselves would value an oral form um, more than a written form. Um, one of the um, one of the ladies who who lives in Uelagua um, and is working with people there, um, she did ask for some help with some literacy things, and I assumed she meant Uelagua. And I was saying, oh, I don't really know. I'm not. I've, I don't really know very much about literacy. Um, I've done a little bit because <laughs> there's nobody else in Dodoma who's doing it. Um, but actually, she wanted to know about improving Swahili literacy because. Um, that was what people wanted more um, and the Swahili literacy I think as a their organization had kind of said that's actually what would give them better access to the resources that are available at the moment. Um, they do use a trial orthography that SIL was involved in creating and have been using it for a while but I don't think they do much literacy work. Um, I think the, the people who they have translating can read-ish, um, but the people who are writing it down are the expats um, people there who are who are basically only writing it down so that they can translate it back into Swahili so that our translation side can, can check, um, but they're not at the moment intending on producing a, a written product. Um, might change and maybe they'll ask SIL for help at some stage. If they, yeah. yeah, but at the moment it's not seen, as you said, it's not seen as a priority. And, and also political issue that, that is bothering me quite a lot. I mean, I'm usually in an environment where uh, my good colleague Felix Ameta is around with a very outspoken vision on this issue that uh, the written uh, written word is passé and this is from the past and, and this is not the future. And, but when I work with, uh, well, Andrew knows Basilica in, uh, in Iraq, who is very good at orthography and still with thousands of little things to, uh, to think about, uh, I, I, I see, and that's also what I hear a little bit in, in, in your presentation and your answers, that there's uh, so much enormous development in, in thinking about language in, among our speakers by thinking about these issues and by writing uh, that, that, that we don't have when, when we abolish writing. So I'm, I'm a little bit in two minds about this. So I wonder what your, what your personal, um, yeah. yeah. Well, I think Thank for you. me, um, because I um, grew up in Usandawe, so to speak, my first SIL involvement was in Sandawe. There, um, the, the people I was working with, Daniel and Elizabeth Hunsker, who were there for many years, they, they were focusing on writing at the beginning, but very quickly realized um, that audio was a really helpful way to go and that people were really interested in audio and video. So in the end, everything they ever translated was um, also produced in audio form and they um, got hold of um, sort of mp3 players um, that play out quite loudly with a little loudspeaker um, to, to use in the community and that was very popular um, so they they would say yeah you you have to go down the audio route but there are always a few people who are very interested in the writing whereas I think where I am now it's not quite like that there are far more people who are valuing writing who like reading and writing the general levels of education are much higher in a and 
people speak um, Bantu languages and uh, writing them is not usually so difficult compared to writing Swahili. So the gap is not so much, but obviously in the Rift Valley, you've got a lot of people speaking a lot of languages that are not very like Swahili. So it's quite an interesting context for literacy. And I think as an organization, we've definitely gone more into um, audio and video in recent years as technology becomes more possible in these parts of the world. Um, personally, my role is very much linguistics and, and not involved in that, but I can see um, how it impacts communities more. Um, there are one of the issues where we try, we've tried to do things like we've written booklets on um, uh, how to protect yourself against AIDS, for example, that would be one of the um, sort of non-Bible things that we're working on um, uh, among many of us. And um, something like that in audio form on a radio would probably be very effective or if in a song or something like that. But we're also, it's a little bit difficult to use local languages on the radio here. So that's one of our problems as well. Um, but I think um, in terms of practicality, what really um, meets the people's needs, then it isn't, it is often something other than written form. But a lot of what we do assumes we have a record somewhere of the written form in order to check it, um, produce it later, reproduce it. So it's going alongside all the audio, all the audio that was produced, produced in Sandawe, there's also a written version of it um, as well. So it, it's, it's there for people who want it, even if they are few. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, um, I just saw a question that related to that, but um, I mentioned the Hunsikers, they are, they, they are currently in Tanzania, they are still working, but not specifically on Sandawe. Um, they left a few years ago, but they're doing more recording and audio work. Um, the Sandawe project is sort of stopped for now, but may restart in some form. So watch this space. Are there any more questions or comments? No, I think then we've reached the end. Um, so thank you again very much for a very interesting presentation. I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that the recordings of all of the presentations in the Rift Valley webinar series can be found on the Rift Valley Network YouTube page. And the entries for each presentation are added to the Rift Valley bibliography. And the next webinar will be on the 17th of November and the details will be announced later in the newsletter. So thank you again for the presentation, everyone else, of course, for participating today. And I hope to see you again at our next webinar.